to Hello. a beautiful Thursday morning or afternoon coming up. Not too hot. Beautiful day for yard work. That's what I'm going to be doing this afternoon. Hmm. Welcome to our guests. Do we have guests to, to introduce anyone? Don't see anybody on yet. Okay, let me know. We have a number of our members that we need to um, send congratulations to and our appreciation. Tom Grinslade, 57 years, a member of our downtown Kiwanis Club. Uh, 2003 President Ted Mao, 34 years. The two, uh, 2002 President and photographer extraordinaire, Rush Yelverton, 30 years. Uh, Bill Murphy, 29 years. Uh, Eric Rowland, a Kiwanis Foundation board member, 27 years. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Moon, 15 years. Congratulations to those uh, members. I have a few additional announcements. Uh, just a reminder uh, to past presidents that your annual meeting to select career and civic awards is tomorrow evening, tomorrow morning on Zoom at 8.30 a.m. There will be a reminder email um, with the link. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Duke and Wendy for lining up um, a number of opportunities for us to serve. Uh, you're invited to pick one day to participate, whether it's a gift of time or a financial contribution. Um, be sure to save these dates and more information will be on, um, on the web. There are two Saturday morning options at Gleaners Food Bank, at nine, uh, September 17 and October 22nd. Uh, the Riley Project with the Indiana District um, to assemble craft kits and bring donated uh, items on Sunday afternoon, September 18, um, near Lafayette Square, as a matter of fact, on Lafayette Road, and that's from one o'clock in the afternoon to 4 p.m. Salvation Army Coats for Kids um, will be from Monday, October 10 to Saturday, October 15 as well as a collection at the Colts game uh, on Sunday, October 2nd. Um, go to indykiwanis.org um, slash service and a lot more details as to time and location, et cetera, will be um, uh, published. We'll be sending um, you more emails or, or more details in the mail about these um, opportunities along with your Kiwanis member information for next year. Roger um, has an important announcement. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, this is an announcement for next week on Wednesday, which is uh, August 24th. Roger, can you turn up your sound, please? Sure, sure can. Anybody else be able to hear me? A little bit better. OK, Is that better? Um, next Wednesday, August 24th, at 5.30, there's a, a meeting. Uh, it's a, a district meeting. So uh, this is being put on by Marge Crouch uh, from the uh, Indy Metro Division. But we're invited to that. Uh, I will be going. I don't know who else is going. Uh, it starts at 5.30. It's at New Hope, which is 8450 North Payne Road. Uh, they're looking for RSVP, so if anyone is interested in going and have not uh, signed up yet, uh, I would suggest send a note to me uh, via email, or you can call me, and I'll send her our total list of people that might be attending. Uh, it's going to be uh, Taka Ogata, which is our current governor, and Governor-elect Bruce Andrews will both be there, so we'll hear what's What's going on with that, that, that group? Riley Volunteer Coordinator Susan Schwartz will be there and talk about how to serve and sign up for this Comfort Cart Ambassador uh, program. Um, and I think we need to, I would like to see us do it as a group 
Uh, there's an orientation program. And the one that I've heard about that's kind of neat is a three hour uh, orientation, which includes a tour of the facility. If you haven't been to Riley, I think it's a great way to get initiated. Uh, so here again, if it's next Wednesday. If you're interested, uh, let Kelly or myself know, and we'll get the RSVP over to Marge. Free dinner, free free meal at 5.30, and then program starts at 6. So it's open to anybody in our club if you'd like to attend. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Mm -hmm. um, Eric is, is with us as, as well, I think. Hi, I'm Carol. To talk to us about the golf outing. Hi, Eric. Hey. Thanks, Judge Carol. Certainly. So it's nice to have Eagle Creek on the call today as our featured speaker. September 19th, Monday, September 19th, we're going to have our annual scramble. We are third year in a row at Eagle Creek. Their head pro, Matt Parrott, does a great job taking care of us. And some of these prices are even locked into what we we're paying 12, 13 years ago. So it's an affordable outing. Look forward to seeing everybody there. Thanks to the team at Gelzer Investments for their $5,000 title sponsorship. Thanks to my dad, Don Steele, for his $1,500 cart sponsorship. Thanks to Jeanne Ann Kirby, again, for getting her company, Indiana Members Credit Union, involved. Thanks to Duke Haddad, Bill Du Bois, Steve Willem for sponsoring foursomes. Our company will make a little bit of a client event out of it. We'll bring about five foursomes. So again, that's Eagle Creek Golf Course, Monday, September 19th. We're looking forward to, to seeing you there. Since 2015, our foundation has awarded more than $175,000 to 44 local organizations. Please visit indiacawanis.org slash grants for information to share with community groups you think might be a good fit. The deadline to apply for external grants is September 30th. A past recipient. Good morning, Trent. Thanks for joining us. Uh, a past recipient, <laughs> the Peace Learning Center, is here to share a recap of their grant. So I believe Miss Claire Wildhack Nolan from the Peace Learning Center is here. If she could please walk us through some of the good work they're doing. You've got the podium. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And this is great. You all planned this so well that we're here on the Eagle Creek Day. I don't know if many of you are familiar. Claire, I think you accidentally hit mute. Thank you for trying to unmute me. I was like, I, did you hear much of that? <laughs> I'll start from the top. <laughs> so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. And thank you so much for awarding us a grant. It is always really useful. Um, and it's also great timing. You, you did a great job planning of having us as part of also your Eagle Creek crew here because we are housed at Eagle Creek Park as an organization. You probably already knew that. But I put our website um, in the chat for you. And um, you granted a very specific program as part of our youth program. It's also part of our equity programming that we do at the Peace Learning Center. Um, raise your hand if you have ever heard of Peace Learning Center though first, if you know our organization. It looks like quite a few of you have. We're really excited because we're celebrating our 25th year of doing peace education in Indianapolis. And that has looked different ways. Um, we work with people of all ages right now. We serve nonprofits during COVID, which you funded a year, which was our biggest year with COVID, um, that we started really doing a lot of online work. So we're serving Indianapolis, Indiana, but we also have really branched out and we have a global scope now in a lot of the work that we do. Um, we focus on social emotional learning, equity, and restorative practices, which is a form of conflict resolution and community culture of problem solving and healing um, conflicts over punishing conflict. So we do a lot of work with youth and youth serving organizations, but we also do a lot of um, service with organizations all across the city and state who do caring work a lot of times. So we work with people who are in the healthcare field, um, who do community development, as well as even corporations. Um, 
The program you specifically funded in your grant to give us, I believe, $2,500 towards our social justice leadership camp, which is in our ninth year of operation this year. Um, it was started here at Peace Learning Center by myself, my colleague, Mamie Keita, and two amazing um, interns who were working with us and um, a lot of students and youth from the Indianapolis area. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and share with you a little bit about um, the year 2021, but also a little bit about 2020, which was, I believe, the year you funded us for. That year was the year of COVID. So a lot of our work with youth was derailed because as you can imagine, trying to do a camp on Zoom was not happening. <laughs> so what we ended up doing, which was really cool, was connecting and supporting some of our past youth leaders in developing their facilitation skills by facilitating conversations around social justice and leadership and peace and justice with other youth. Um, so we were able to serve about, um, you know, over 200 youth through the library, the Marion County Public Libraries, through also um, School 70 um, and IPS, as well as working with um, another community group that is called Share Camp, who had youth participate. And so um, when we talk about Social Justice Leadership Camp and what you funded, I just also wanted to be able to share with you our mission and vision. The goal of the camp is to develop confident and knowledgeable leaders who analyze systemic power in order to build a more equitable society. So a lot of the skills that we focus on at camp are really creating a space that is safe and brave for youth to connect with each other, build relationships and build community. Um, we want the space to be very inclusive and supportive and caring, a space that is creative, healthy and joyful. Um, we also, I think this was really important about our camp, especially in 2021. So the funding you gave us for 20, what we didn't use because we were dealing with virtual and COVID issues rolled over to support our camp in 2021 in those spaces where we could actually come together. Um, and what you, what we know, I think you supporting that camp was really essential because a lot of our students miss class time, they miss relationship building time, and a lot of them were dealing with a lot of stress and pain from the COVID experience, as well as a lot of the other general issues that were coming up in our society. Um, and so we offered a lot of, in our organization and in our um, work at Social Justice Camp, we offer and provide opportunity for education. We infuse it with, with critical thinking skills and relationship and social emotional learning. Um, and so a lot of those things, kids were experiencing a lack of having missed their class time. And we really supported that work in the conversations, the dialogue, the learning, the community tours and the relationship building that we did at camp in 2021. Um, and a lot of our goal of camp is to work specifically with youth, understanding and hearing the voices of youth, lifting up their power that they already have as young people, to think about how they can make a more peaceful and just world. So we ask them to not just look at their, we, we ask them to look at their own choices. We ask them to think about how they're thinking about themselves. A lot of middle school and high school students um, often, and that's the age group for social justice camp is 13 to, to 19, so middle school and high school ages. A lot of them go through, I don't know if you know, you remember back to your time in that, that developmental stage, but they're going through a lot of trying to individuate, figure out who they are, what they believe in, what they care about, who they're not, and also go through a lot of self um, insecurity at times. So we create a space where people can think about all those things in a space that's also encouraging and looking at how they might be impacted with things that could make them insecure or have low self-esteem so that they can come out of that feeling more empowered. We also ask them to look at how power is used by laws, policies, procedures, and if those laws historically and currently are being used well. And if they were going to design things as leaders, what would they do to make things just and fair and to create peace? So we pose these big questions to them that they tackle and they really do a beautiful job taking on. They have the knowledge and ability to do that. Um, so these are just kind of our approach and we use a lot of the things that we develop at Social Justice at, at Peace Learning Center that we're teaching adults. We use them also with students. So we incorporate, like I said, a lot of, if there's a problem, we come together as a community to try to talk about it, solve it and to keep everyone included 
and ask them to raise their behavior, raise their thinking, their participation, their inclusion to make a space for everyone. Um, so we do a lot of restorative work as well as communal work um, to help give them an example of what that feels like to be a part of. Because a lot of them haven't experienced that in schools. It's oftentimes a more top-down structure. So they really get a chance to connect in community with other youth. And I think one of the things they take away from it a lot of times is they're connecting with youth that they have never met before, maybe go to schools they've never been to, live in areas of the city they've never been to, might be a different ethnic group or gender or sexuality or race than they are. And they build really strong friendships. At the end, many of our participants say they feel like they're a part of a little family. Um, and so just to show you some pictures of different things that came out of our social justice camp um, 2021, in 2020, like I said, we mentored different youth right here. One of our youth leaders is in the front um, and she's been a strong part of camp. And a lot of the funding that you gave us was to help support she and other leaders before they went off to college to be proficient in facilitating community dialogue around topics of equity, identity, um, and peace. And so that helped with that. And then here we have um, the group in 2021 when we actually got to be together. So any funding left over from 2020 would have rolled over to 2021. So this is our group and we got to be at the, have any of you been to the Kennedy King Memorial Initiative downtown um, or to the park there? Yeah, so it was really wonderful. We have had a partnership the last two years with KKMI where they've hosted us at their site. So it's really powerful to be at that historic site talking about um, social justice and youth power um, at such a, an important space for our city. This was our group and we had students from all different schools, different townships. Um, and so it really does bring a great mix of youth and the commonality that they all share is that they care and that they want to make a better world for everyone. And they want people to be included and feel powerful and cared for. Um, and so that might be the only thing they have in common but they build their leadership. And I was really excited because Washington Township scholarships some of their students to come as well, who are all part of um, an equity leadership group in their school. And they took their skills from last year um, and brought those to their school and did a wonderful job being leaders in their school-based group. So much so that their school brought those clubs and some of their classes out to Peace Learning Center to participate in further work workshops with us. And they decided to scholarship students this year to come again. So a lot of your money, um, what we use it for is for running the camp and making sure that there are no barriers for campers who can't afford it to come. And also to make sure that every single student is having healthy snacks and food while they're at camp, because a lot of people throughout the Indianapolis area are food insecure, especially in this time post-COVID. Um, so here's our group at our site. Let's see if I can get... A lot of times we meet together in circle and we try to make it a space that feels like their space, like it is for the teenagers, by the teenagers. So we'll sit on the floor, we'll be very comfortable, we'll take breaks, we play games, and we get into really deep conversations, invite them to get to know each other, share their lives and share their voices. Um, and so these are different activities we do where they are working collaboratively to think about identity and power. Here we do a cultural sharing piece. These sisters both attended and they brought different elements from their culture to share with the community and talk about how it's important and why to them. Um, here we do a lot of team building activities. So this is a famous one we have called Pipeline where we talk about resiliency and persistence as well as um, the necessity to make change and to make peace, to be able to work and collaborate. A lot of the social emotional 21st century skills are covered in the work that we do. And they got it, they finally won the obstacle. Um, we also do a lot of different community tours. In 2020, we, were, we, we, we host lunches and we invite different leaders in the community to join us, but because of COVID, we weren't able to do that. So we hosted two different community tours. This is Alina Fennell, and she worked with us through Public Allies. And she learned a lot about this community. Her family grew up in the area and um, it's going through a lot of changes in downtown Indianapolis. So she highlighted what's called asset space thinking about community. Um, we went and looked at some of the changes that are taking place. We looked at the history of the area, and then we visited some of the local spaces. 
We also um, navigated the downtown area. We went to the city county council. We went to the Capitol building. We looked at some of the different federal legislators offices and we looked at what is happening in our downtown area. What kind of choices and decisions around development are being made, how that connects with the different populations and economics, uh, economic related, including um, people who are, are dealing with um, homelessness or are unhoused. Um, we also then at the end, we invite the leaders, of course, to lead and they put together an event to share with their family members. This year, we couldn't invite outside committee members, but we did invite family members and they did a showcase about a lot of the things that they learned and what they took away from camp. And they always put together amazing things. Um, they did everything from art presentations to relaxation and mindfulness to understanding about LGBTQ plus history. Um, to thinking about how we can use art to speak our minds and share messages with our communities. And so we were really proud of them because they all came together as a group so well and shared so much of what is important to them and passionate and really invited other people into that space and gave, gave feedback. So this was our group from last year that you made possible for them to attend camp and have a really rich experience. Um, and all the students who are a part of camp, um, like we have 90 to 100%, um, so far who have graduated from high school. Um, a lot of our students are middle schoolers, so they haven't even started to attend high school. So we're, we're continuing to watch that. But over the nine years, we have been really excited to see a great outcome in terms of graduation rates, as well as a lot of our youth stay engaged in their schools. Um, they really start to um, engage in making sure they're getting good grades and what they want for their future is, is happening. Um, they invest in themselves and they don't feel alone, which can be really big sometimes in the landscape. So I'm open to questions. I know I just talked a lot. This is um, my baby. I love this camp. And each year I just see we have small but powerful groups. Um, we have, you know, our desire to have it be a small group um, because of the intimacy and the way that people can really connect. And we see a lot of powerful outcomes um, and impact from those from those small groups. So thank you for making it happen. We couldn't really do it without you. <laughs> Any, Any questions? questions? Any questions? Claire, that was that was wonderful. Thanks for um, telling us all about uh, what you do, and thanks for everything you do for the kids in our community. What a, what a great organization. <laughs> thank you so much. It's the most amazing job ever and I love it. So thank you for, for sharing and supporting us and supporting the young people who come to camp because that's really what it's all about. Oh my um, word, what a, what a fantastic <laughs> job you're doing. Wonderful people. Thank well, you and coming. have a great, thank thanks you for, for all being your part of our, our meeting today. Yeah, have a good one. I'll see you later. I got to jump off to go facilitate another group but it's great to meet have you. Have a good one. Uh, Greg? I'm turning it over to you to introduce um, a very special person. You're muted, muted, Greg. Okay, I wanna thank Claire for that fantastic uh, work she's doing out there. Uh, we all appreciate it. And it's certainly the most important part of the, of the uh, I mean, very important part of the city. So, um, I wanted to, before I introduce Anne, I wanted to take a couple moments to um, give us a perspective of what Anne is doing. Um, in June of 1972, the park was created, Eagle Creek Park. It's one of the largest metropolitan parks in Indianapolis, in the um, America, in the United States. It has 5,400 acres, of which I think 3,900 are in land, and you know the water out there. Uh, but um, but pre-park, I uh, had some involvement with that. I go back um, to the um, finding of a lot of Native American artifacts at um, Eagle Creek Park, particularly along Wilson Road in the, in the uh, lands there. And uh, the Black Lab at uh, Bloomington has, had done some study of how old um, some of the sites, uh, some of the findings were uh, that were found by a person named Dino Martins. Some go back 5,000 years uh, into um, Native Americans that were living along the, the creeks, Fishback Creek and uh, Eagle Creek. Now, as we know, the Lilly Estate, uh, Purdue University, the Block Estate are all part of this park now. And uh, just around 1972, I got involved with the park because of um, 
an unlimited contract that um, a former mayor had provided for uh, gravel mining in the back behind the what was the nature center. Um, we banded together a bunch of lawyers and we were able to get um, the authorities uh, to be to stop that gravel mining on an open contract. Now it's a nature uh, preserve in the back there as well. In fact, much of the park is a nature preserve, a state nature, nature preserve, a starling nature preserve, et cetera, and uh, a major flyway for birds and for animals sa sanctuary and a major water supply for the city of Indianapolis. So uh, birders use it, swimmers use it, hikers use it, kayakers. Uh, um, and I was involved with as a uh, oversight with Citizens Advisory Committee with Eric Servas and others that prevented um, commercialization. And as you know, the park is not commercialized. It has multi-uses, but it's not commercialized. Uh, Mayor Hudnett has a lot to do with, had a lot to do with that. And uh, uh, Dr. Harry Feldman and Mar Mar Margaret Matthews as well. Um, I had many hikes out there with various people that were amazed at the beauty of it. I remember taking the president of Sierra Club there once and from Washington and we saw an osprey dive in and catch a fish right before us, our eyes. Uh, Governor O'Bannon uh, was a frequent hiker out there with his uh, wife and um, uh, Judy and we, we hiked together. So Anne um, uh, Seshur has been uh, working to um, provide uh, uh, history of what the last 50 years uh, have been. I tried to give a little bit, I don't know the history before that other than what I know from the archeology span uh, about the history of the park and um, is involved with the project, which she's gonna uh, give us some, um, some initial um, pro project um, uh, update, update. And, um, and PBS is involved and we're gonna try to do a, a really nice piece for um, the history of a park and how to, how to do it right. And so she works with Indy Parks and uh, I wanna turn it over to her and I'll, I'll try to moderate questions. And I know that she's been working really hard on this and we have a committee that is uh, helping bring um, various, um, uh, various uh, users together to talk about this uh, PBS special that we're going to work with WFYI. So without further ado, Anne, um, tell us about what you're doing and, and how you've, uh, what you've learned so far about this uh, park. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, so can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Um, so I, uh, I start, became associated with the park um, in around 2008. I took the Indiana Master Naturalist class um, and uh, I loved getting involved with it. And I started out leading school kids on hikes uh, when they came for field trips. Um, and I got really curious about the old things in the park. And later on, I worked at the Ornithology Center for about five years, um, and um, that my passion for history just developed into me becoming um, the park historian. Um, so I've collected a lot of pictures and information over the years. Um, and I have some things to share with you today about the history of the Nature Center. But the, um, the project that Greg referred to, I'm really excited about. Um, someone had approached uh, so, um, some people from the park about um, making a film about the 50 years of the park and, and also before the park um, and before the reservoir was built. Um, so I'm really excited about the project and there are a lot of stories that I've tried to tell uh, with a Facebook page that I have, which I can share that site with you. Um, it's called ECP, facebook.com slash ECP history. Um, but um, I'm really excited about the possibility of this documentary and, um, and getting to tell more of the story to a wider audience and with just an awesome filmmaker who um, I've gotten to meet. And uh, he's, he's really good at talking with people, hearing their stories and uh, getting good videos. So, um, so I'm excited about that. And um, uh, I'll just go into talking about the history of the nature centers um, and a little bit the, about the 50th anniversary of the park. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can you see that? All right, so uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the park and we've already had uh, one celebration. It was a little bit rainy, but um, we were able to uh, 
um, move inside for a concert that we had. And um, so it, uh, it's just the beginning. And we're planning to have some history events in the fall and um, I will get more information to you that as those, those plans are developed. So um, in the beginning, um, of be long before the park, uh, this is a picture of what the Nature Center, now Ornithology Center, looked like in the probably the early 1940s. I don't have an exact date on this picture, um, but this is when J.K. Lilly Jr. of the Lilly Pharmaceutical Company um, owned uh, quite a bit of land in the park. And he started out with this piece of property where the Ornithology Center is now. Um, he used it as his private library. And so, um, so it's built uh, differently than most um, homes and most other buildings. It has uh, sh uh, iron shutters on all the windows that can be securely closed. It has extra thick walls and floors. Um, and it was built really to be like a museum. His library uh, housed his collections of um, miniature soldiers and he had gold coins in a vault there. And he had books which are now in the Lilly Library at IU. So um, this talk is mostly about the nature centers, uh, the nature center and the history of the nature centers here in the park. So um, I won't be able to talk more about Mr. Lilly, but if you look on the Facebook page, there are quite a few pictures and information about some of the other history of the park. I, um, that's ECP history on Facebook. Um, so this is a picture of the Nature Center as it looked in the early 70s. And this Jeep belonged to one of the employees, Mike Norris, who recently passed away. Um, but he shared some pictures from the early days of the park with me. Uh, Margaret Matthews was a key person in developing the Nature Center along with Harry Feldman. And this is a quote from her that was in a newspaper article from the 1990s. Harry Feldman and I got the inspiration to make a Nature Center in 1971. And he and I were putting it together, writing the curriculum. And we spent long hours for five months so we could open as an education center in 1972. And they did programs for a lot of different groups and they developed a relationship with the public schools. Um, and so uh, they provided programming that hadn't really been provided in Indianapolis before. This is another picture of the nature center in the early days. And there looks like there might be some cages outside. They had some animals in cages outside a little differently than, than today. And this is what the door looked like. And Harry Feldman is standing on the right and talking with some visitors as they leave. This is what the Nature Center would look, have looked like um, in 1972 when the park opened. Um, and if you've been there more recently, you can see that it's quite a bit different. Um, so they had a lot of animals displayed, both native and non-native animals. And some people who worked um, and volunteered in the park in those days told me that um, that the naturalist at the, at the nature center knew about how to care for animals. So people would bring rescue animals to them. And back then uh, we didn't have um, the wildlife rehabilitator program like we do now um, where the animals are taken to licensed rehabbers. Um, so uh, there, were, there were lots of different animals in, in the nature center. Um, this is a short video, if I can get it to play, um, of uh, Harry Feldman. Is that Harry Feldman? Uh, no, <laughs> that's a turtle. <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna lag on me or not, we'll see. There we go. Feldman, who was the first administrator of Eagle Creek Park, now operates the Nature Center in what used to be J.K. Lilly's library. We try to introduce the uh, five uh, classifications of birds or animals. You know, in other words, we have fish and amphibians, and these are live now, fish, amphibians, and uh, reptiles, mammals, and birds. And that ties in with the curriculum of the schools when they're uh, teaching natural science. A vault in Lilly's library housed his collection of paintings, rare stamps, and coins, 
which are now at the Smithsonian. Oops. So, um, so that video was from a, a, a special that Channel 8 did on their news. Um, there was a newscaster named Ray Rice who actually lived near the park. And I believe he lived in a historic house that's on Reed Road now, an older house. Um, but uh, he did a really nice special. And I, uh, someone I know had, I think it was the Pike Township Historical Society had a videotape of that that I was able to get a copy of. So um, the log that is still in front of the Ornithology Center today was brought in 1976. Um, and it was uh, brought from Oregon um, and for a, for a convention. I wanna say Kiwanis, uh, Kiwanis Convention, but I might need to look that up. Um, anyway, it was brought uh, to promote uh, tourism in Oregon and to promote their logging industry. Um, and so if you look on my Facebook page, you'll see, um, you'll, you'll see a picture of Mayor Hudna standing with the log when it was on display outside the convention center. And also there was another log for a long time that was displayed outside the nature center that had different points in history that showed the age of the log. And Harry Feldman is showing a group of children that, that log in this picture. So after Mr. Feldman retired from uh, working uh, for being the director at the Nature Center, um, he read a book called Wildflower Fanciful Tales, and it was dedicated to his partner at the Nature Center, Margaret Matthews. Um, and um, the reason I'm showing you this uh, book at this point is that they did a lot of uh, hikes and walks and talks about nature, and they used these stories to teach children about the wildflowers. Um, so this particular picture is one that, that I really like, um, and it's about the spring beauty. And you can see the spring beauty in the lower right-hand corner. And uh, the story is that the, the fairies painted the lines on the flowers and they made the, uh, the um, they made the flower so that the bees could find it. So there'd be something for the bees to eat early on. And all of their stories uh, were fanciful, but and with the pictures, but they um, had facts with them to help teach the children scientific facts about nature. Oops, let's back up. So there was a hummingbird garden that was developed outside. And, and some of this is still there, but a lot of it has moved to um, the north end of the building where there is, uh, are also bird feeders today. So um, one of the uh, volunteers early on was Michael Thorne and he shared some things that he had saved with me. And so when people were volunteering at the Nature Center, they would be sent these uh, postcards or be given these cards and they would keep track of their own hours. And this was the uh, badge that they would wear. Um, early on the, um, the Junior League did a lot of volunteering and they had a partnership for about 10 years um, with the Nature Center uh, and they provided the volunteers. They even had childcare available. They had sort of like a co-op childcare set up at the, uh, at the Nature Center um, so that people who had young children could volunteer as well. Um, and uh, Mr. Feldman and Mrs. Matthews trained the volunteers um, in how to work with the children who came and there were thousands of children who came for field trips. I don't know exactly why they presented this key to the city uh, to Harry Feldman, but um, uh, Jenny Finch, who's uh, next to Mr. Feldman, um, her son shared this picture with me. And this is an article that was about Paul Smith, who is one of the, um, the people who, one of the volunteers who led wildflower walks. Here's a picture, Greg might be able to tell you about some of the people in this picture. Harry Feldman is in the middle. Um, Greg Silver is standing in the back and uh, beside Michael Thorne. Uh, do you, know, you have anything to add, Greg? Picture. Uh... Oh, there we go. Um, I think that could have been uh, the dedication of the center to his name. Um, Michael Thorne's in the back. Of course, Harry's there. Um, these are all the wonderful Junior League and others 
that were always there to help uh, when he um, when he gave presentations. And I don't know the exact event, but it probably was a dedication um, of the center in his name uh, by the city council. It was called the Feldman Nature Center. And there's still um, some information inside of the nature, the ornithology center about all that. Okay. Yeah, I have a few more pictures of that as well. So you think this might have been at the city county building? I don't know. No, I think, uh, I don't know. I, I can't tell. Um, I, okay. I don't know. It was one of his events that he had with the junior league, probably, and the supporters of this. Um, well, yeah, the volunteers. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, okay. in there. I'm in there, but I don't remember exactly. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I couldn't quite place where the picture was, but I knew there are a lot of key people in there. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is something that um, uh, that Harry wrote to some of the volunteers, and it just shows that he, he cared so much for the volunteers and, um, and, and worked closely with them and the teachers and the children, and um, he inspired a lot of people. He gave shows, um, he gave programs uh, every Sunday about a different animal, uh, which was well attended at the, nat at the Nature Center. Um, I, th yeah. I, th I don't know, I think I might have a picture of that, we'll see. Um, so uh, the Junior League um, partnership with the Nature Center ended um, after about 10 years because they're, they're a charitable organization. They're involved in many, many things. So um, uh, after that, the Park Foundation, um, which supports uh, so many of the things we do in the park, um, they were founded in 1978. Um, but there still was not enough funding to keep the Nature Center going at one point. So they came up with some um, ideas to get people to support the Nature Center and to help keep the programs going and to help keep it open every day. Um, there was at one time talk about not having it open every day or um, other things, other ways of cutting back or maybe not having it open in the winter. Um, and uh, the naturalists and the volunteers and the director didn't want that. So um, one of the things they did was called stake a claim and people would do a donation and it would be symbolic, but it would be for a part of the park. And so they had this event to kick it off. And um, I did not know all of the people in this picture, but um, I, I did a program of this with the, the volunteers. And some of them remember the man, the tall man with the interesting mustache um, is big John Gillis. Right. Some of you may remember him. Um, he, was, uh, he was the helicopter guy for WIBC for years for the radio station. Um, and so he was helping to promote this. And Eric Servas, uh, his family has contributed a lot to the community. I don't know his exact role in this, but um, this check was presented to the Nature Center um, and he, he assigned the check. So he had some affiliation with Turtle Magazine, apparently. Um, right. So this, this was a map they used for, the, for, for this kickoff party that they had. So this is a, a nice picture of Margaret Matthews and she's sitting in a room that was dedicated to her. And I'll tell you more about that later, but the article is very nice. Just talking about how um, she started coming to, she started being involved with the Nature Center um, when she was a teacher. And then when she retired, her involvement increased even more. And it's talking about how the woods is her classroom. Um, so uh, then um, let's see. Uh, this uh, Greg might be able to tell you a little bit more about this, but this is when that room, which you see right here, uh, it used to be a patio outside of the nature center, and it was enclosed to make it into a room that looks out over the reservoir where you can view birds. Um, That's right. and, yep. and so these pictures are from the dedication of that room after it was remodeled. So if you want to say a few words about this, you could, Greg. Well, Margaret was a fantastic um, uh, expert on wildflowers uh, and uh, helped with her, Harry to lay out the entire road system in the park to avoid major, major trees. And, uh, and they did a great job. On the right is uh, Gordon Gilmer, who uh, was the city councilor that supported all of us, uh, along with uh, Bert Servas and the mayor. So yes, that was when we dedicated it. We decided that we found funding to uh, enclose it so it could, people could sit there and look at the beauty of it. Otherwise it was so cold in the winter, you couldn't go out there. So uh, Lily had it as a porch and uh, that was fine, but we enclosed it and now you can, uh, you can watch the birds or you can watch uh, 
the beautiful um, scenery in the winter and not not be freezing out there. So yes, this is a big deal, and um, this was something that the city helped uh, us with uh, to fund it. I have a few more pictures. Um, so they had a ribbon cutting, and then you can see Margaret walking in. She looks so happy in the picture um, with Gordon Gilmer. She's a lovely lady. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, and then this is what that room looks like now. And um, I wanted to tell you about another um, person that was very important at the Nature Center who I believe Greg knew well. I didn't get an opportunity to meet him, but Bud Starling started um, hikes with the Amos Butler Audubon Society in I believe 1971. And those continue to today. Um, almost nothing stops these hikes. I've seen people going on the Sunday morning bird walk when it was 15 degrees below zero wind chill. Um, it, and not, not much will prevent them from going. But anyway, this is his family. Um, they uh, came to a dedication in, I believe it was 2017. Uh, no, maybe 2015. Um, and this panel that tells about Mr. Starling and has photos from um, his life. Uh, he also wrote a column in the newspaper and on the Facebook page, uh, the history Facebook page, I put some of the, I believe I put some of those columns. You and did. some yeah. some of those were compiled into a book, um, which was illustrated by another longtime Amos Butler Audubon Society member, Donna McCarty. And Donna actually is uh, the main person who leads the Sunday morning bird walk now. So, um, and Judy O'Bannon came to that dedication. I don't have her picture here, but she came that day and spoke um, in the uh, in the classroom. Um, and uh, so it was a really nice day for everyone. Um, so this is some pictures of some of the bird birding groups over the years um, in all kinds of weather. I love the one with the snow. Um, it just uh, is typical of, of them going out no matter what the weather. Um, and Greg already referred to um, some of the work that the Amos Butler Audubon Society has done to protect the park. And as I've researched the history, I've just found so many times that they helped to intervene to stop development from happening that would have um, harmed the wildlife and harmed the nature in the park. So this was just, uh, this was from the newsletter, um, which was written by Charlie Keller, another birding hero of mine. Um, and uh, he was talking about how they were, um, what was the development at the time? Um, I don't know, there was a lot of uh, issues, <laughs> covered bridges, yeah. covered bridges so it, fake bird uh, calls. Uh, you know, it was just something that you had to say, no, this is a park that we want to leave alone. And yes, Charlie Keller um, and his wonderful wife, uh, they were they were stalwarts in that. And you know, I got to give credit to um, Bill Hudnut, the mayor who helped us help moderate situations. Um, sometimes the park directors were uh, more uh, commercial oriented, oriented than others. And, but, um, but in the end, uh, we have what we have and it's a vigil. Um, one of the issues that came up uh, was uh, there was uh, the water quality of uh, that reservoir. Be, uh, it has, it's our water, so it has to be kept, uh, kept clean. And uh, those are issues that wanna make sure nothing was uh, polluting that. Um, and there have been threats to that, but, um, and again, uh, we all kind of banded together uh, to uh, make sure. Now, uh, the Sierra Club also was involved with that uh, effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so we're just grateful for all of that. And, and as I've worked at the park, I know it's a balance between recreation and nature, and we want to preserve the nature, but we want to give it a place for people to come to. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, over the years, a pretty good job has been done to, yeah, to preserve the nature and give people a, a great place to be. Good balance, yeah. Yes, um, and I, uh, I got to um, talk with Jenny Hacker over the phone um, and she uh, was in the picture of, she was one of the, one of the younger people in the picture um, of the Junior League. Uh, so uh, I got to talk with her a little bit and find out some of her memories from um, being at the Nature Center. And so over time, uh, Harry Feldman was fairly old when he started actually um, at the park. Uh, and uh, he just kept going. And um, so I, I mentioned about the animals. And so over time, the number of animals was increasing and there were concerns about uh, 
about the nature center that there were too many animals and that things weren't being kept clean enough. So there was talk about making changes um, and she wrote this letter in support of, of Harry. I never had the privilege of, of meeting Harry Feldman, but I've met so many people that were inspired by him um, who have gone on to volunteer at the park and gone on to um, have careers uh, as naturalists. So um, this was just an example of one person telling about their memories. So um, uh, ultimately, Mr. Feldman retired at the age of 77 um, in 1994. And um, this is an invitation that went out to people. Um, when you open the card, it claps. I don't know, it didn't work quite as well. Um, my, rendition of it here. Um, and so these are some pictures from that event. Um, and some of these pictures will feature more of our volunteers because I originally made this, um, made this program to share with the volunteers and to find out about some of their memories, some of the longtime volunteers. So in the lower left-hand corner is Tina Meeks and she worked part of the time at the Nature Center um, and also was a volunteer for many years. And she is still a volunteer with us today. And in the right hand corner is Michael Thorne, and he was very involved um, with volunteering at the Nature Center in the early days, and now he um, volunteers as a gardener uh, with the park still today. Did you have anything to add about this, Greg? You no, know, this event was really important. Uh, the City Council had uh, announced they were going to name the um, uh, Nature Center for Dr. Feldman. Uh, Gilmer, uh, Dr. Uh, Councilor Gilman was behind that. All the people in this picture were just as dedicated to this uh, success of the um of the park and success of the of the nature uh um, aspects of the park as any could be and yes they were all very very dedicated and this is just this shows you just how crowded the room was this was in uh lily lodge which was um uh uh more really more than a home but it was a building um that had uh rooms where people would stay when when the lilies owned the property um, and it was renovated, uh, I believe it was the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so this event was actually held there. And that building is no longer with us because it was a victim of erosion and other things. Um, but uh, the, so, and we have um, on the right here uh, in the middle picture on the far right is Donna McCarty, who I referred to before. She leads hikes with the Audubon Society every Sunday morning and her husband, um, and next to her is Carol Anderson, who just retired a few years ago. She was a long time gate attendant for the park. And in the bottom picture uh, is Carol Anderson again, um, and Carol Cole and Anna uh, Tanjit, who, who both volunteer at the Ornithology Center. Um, and this is a picture of um, the, the I don't know how, what to call this, the plaque for the um, piece for the front door that dedicated the Nature Center to Harry Feldman. And that's uh, Park Director Leon Younger on the right, um, a really uh, stalwart for uh, what was going on out there. And those plaques are still in the Nature, in the Ornithology Center there on the, the wall. In, now they're in Margaret Matthews' room since, right. Um, right. Uh, and I'll tell you more about what happened after the Nature Center became the Ornithology Center, the sign was moved. Um, but it's still there. Um, I think that the man who's standing next to Harry might have been um, like, I don't know if he was a park manager. He, he was uh, some kind of supervisor with uh, right, he was the the environmental. Assist. Yeah, he was the assistant to, uh, to Younger. I can't remember his name, I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. I, I, I never knew him. <laughs> so, and Margaret spoke and Greg spoke and a lot of people spoke about uh, Harry and all he had done for them and for the park. Um, this picture is, is of uh, Karen Lemire and Karen um, uh, started out as the assistant park manager. Um, some people had positions that changed over time and um, I don't know exactly all of the work that she did in the park, but I do know that after Harry Feldman retired that um, she uh, eventually in about 1995 or 1997, she became um, the manager or director of the Nature Center. And um, around that time, the philosophy was changing a little bit about um, what a Nature Center would be. 
And so um, they went more to having native animals on display. Uh, Don Van Diemen is um, the, she's the manager of the Earth Discovery Center now. And, uh, and she's been an inspiration to me um, and to many of us. And she started out as a college student working part-time at the Nature Center. And she said that she came because, uh, for the animals because that's what she enjoyed. And she still, she, now she's a wildlife rehabber um, in addition to her duties at the park. Um, but she was talking about that they found homes for the animals, they found other nature centers for them um, to go to. And some of the animals stayed at the nature center and lived out their natural lives. Um, but there was more of a, a fo focus on um, native animals and on, um, on having different stations in the um, nature center, different sections of the room that would have um, information about different aspects of the environment. And this is a picture of Don Harden or Don, um, I forget her last name now after she got married, but she was, um, she worked at the nature center for many years um, and she was very involved in the Raptor program as um, the park started to uh, do, do more programming with um, the permanently injured birds of prey. So this is uh, about a program she did um, for girls about careers that they could have. Uh, well, Anne, I would add one thing and that is that, um, I know we, we're running out of time. There was uh, the eagles and the ospreys uh, come back and the herons, of course. Uh, to Eagle Creek Park. And so that's really um, a part of uh, the nature that has been reborn there, uh, including migratory white pelicans. So all this uh, kind of led to this balance of nature and a balance of, um, of uh, uh, use for recreation that, that does exist and, and is um, maybe uh, very unusual in, in this, these uh, very large a very large municipal park, including the block of state on the other side, which is mostly wilderness. Right, there's a state dedicated nature preserve on the west side of the park. Um, and a new trail has been put in there to preserve the nature preserve part of things. The trail goes right uh, along the edge in between that nature preserve and the golf course. Uh, so the idea is to protect the nature um, but still give people a chance to um, enjoy a much longer trail. It's about seven miles long. It's not completely done and open, but um, we expect the dedication to happen this year. So uh, another key person um, at the Nature Center uh, it was Kevin Carlson. Uh, Kevin um, became involved with the Amos Butler um, Audubon Society and uh, just uh, has a wealth of knowledge about birds um, and is an expert in construction. His um, business was construction before um, and that continued as he worked at the Nature Center. Um, he's also a great photographer and so this is talking about some of the classes and things that he did. So for about uh, close to 10 years, uh, he did that, but he had this vision for um, something different, um, which I'll tell you more about as we go. Um, also, uh, this talks about some of the volunteers. And so in this picture is Betty Burns, who retired at the age of 91 a few years ago from volunteering. But for many years, she um, helped with programs, with school programs. And this is Jenny Hellrigal, and um, she's the first uh, naturalist that I met when bringing my kids to programs at the park in the early 2000s when they were young. And this is a picture of the pond scoop. Um, there's a, a pond that was uh, developed behind the New Earth Discovery Center now, but for years uh, they found that this pond that the Lily family had built that had a concrete bottom was the best place to find um, insects and uh, frogs and other things. So uh, they would do pond scoops there at the nature center and even after it became the ornithology center. This is what the nature center looked like as things transitioned. And so this is what it looked like in the 2000s. Um, and uh, I can start seeing uh, Kevin Carlson's work here, the woodworking and the cutouts and things on the woodworking are all the kinds of things that 
uh, that he has done uh, for both of the nature centers over the years. Now, this is a picture of the classroom and interesting to me um, is uh, on the far right are bookcases that were used by J.K. Lilly. Um, there used to be eight rows of bookcases in that room, uh, floor to, basically floor to ceiling. Um, and that's where he has his valuable books that form the nucleus of the collection at the Lilly Library at IU. He donated his entire book collection to Indiana University. So uh, this, yes? We're, we're kind of- I think we're a little, we're yeah. running out of time. Carol, maybe one more comment and then um, okay. I definitely want to thank Ann. This is, uh, she's only got the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, the PBS, um, PBS special is coming and uh, go ahead, Ann. Okay, I just have a couple more slides if you don't mind. I'll try and kind sure. of push those quick. Okay, so the Earth Discovery Center was planned for several years before it became a reality. Um, and this is what it looks like today. It's the only uh, it's the only new building that's been built since about 1971 in the park. Um, it was completed in 2007 and it opened a little after that. Um, this is what it looks like on the inside, many programs for ad both adults and children, lots of school groups. Uh, you can see Don Van Neeman who is in the earlier picture. She's sitting inside a cage, uh, a, a box where they, they keep a live uh, black rat snake. Um, and they have turtles and other uh, animals there. And the Ornithology Center that is all about birds opened in 2009. Um, and these are some pictures from the inside. There's now a telescope in Margaret Matthews viewing room. Um, and these are some longtime volunteers who are in these pictures here. Um, and the Owl Fest, um, uh, I got to participate in for the first time last year. It was great fun. Um, this year, I don't have the exact dates, but it'll be in October, I think. I won't say the date, it's the second or third week, or the third or fourth week in October. Um, and so that's the, that's the end of my slide, Joe. Thank you so much. Carol, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Anne. Uh, that's fabulous. And we will you. probably have another program when you do this uh, continuing um, documentary, which uh, hopefully will be uh, supported by the community. And uh, thank okay. you so much. And uh, I'm sure that the Lilies and the Blocks and all those who came before you Dr. Feldman, Margaret Matthews would be very proud of what you have um, shown us today. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have one request. Would you What's please that? order some more snow this winter? The park is so beautiful <laughs> weather when there's snow and wonderful for cross country skiing. Oh, it is. I went there years ago in the 90s and it was just so nice. You're right. It's it's, it's just beautiful all year round. Um, thank you so much for being with us today and spending time telling us about uh, the park and everything that's going on. We are going to make a donation in your honor to any given child Indy, which is an Arts Council of Indianapolis initiative to ensure that all 22,000 IPS K through eight children have equitable access to the creative arts. Um, thanks again, Anne. It was a um, beautiful presentation and so enlightening to know everything that's going on in the park and has been going on. Thanks so much for being with us. I want to thank, thank uh, Kelly, for, Kelly for the graphics uh, and, and helping get this done today. And it's, uh, like I said, it's got to go out there to see it, to believe it and uh, realize what has gone on there and all the folks that have uh, preserved it. And, you know, again, think of the Native Americans that were out there too. Thank you. And thanks, Greg, for making all of this possible today. You're welcome. We'll be back at the Columbia Club next week uh, to hear from Butler's football coach, Mike Urimovich. So hopefully everyone will be uh, present and have a wonderful end of the week and a beautiful weekend. Thank you, Anne. And we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.